<laughs> well, good morning, everybody, and I hope you are all awake and you had a good night's rest. <laughs> and um, thanks for indulging me here with my presentation. So I started with the um, title in Spanish, but in English, but it's Desarrollo las Estrellas Iniciales de la Lectura en un Contexto de Inclusividad. And um, just a bit about uh, my background, you probably noticed from my accent, and yesterday I mentioned that I was from Brazil, but I actually lived also 12 years in Colombia and then 10 years in Mexico, and then I moved into, to the States and did my master's in Latin American studies, and then my uh, PhD later on in educational leadership. And so, and my area of interest is really to develop interventions and assessments that support uh, Spanish-speaking English learners or English learners of any language, but particularly Spanish-speaking English learners. And um, I live now in Dallas, Texas, and one of the reasons I moved to Texas was uh, precisely because the Spanish-speaking population is very large there, and uh, there's a, a lot of need to kind of like improve and figure out how we can improve the academic performance of um, Spanish-speaking students in the States. And show you some details. So um, here I want to thank first uh, the Fulbright uh, for, uh, for providing me with this opportunity to work in Chile again. I've been here several times working with uh, colleagues and the researchers in, uh, in Talca, but also I worked uh, with a uh, private school here in, uh, in Santiago, Nido de Aguilas, on improving the reading, uh, actually, performance of um, uh, and, uh, and helping teachers their Spanish uh, teaching, the Spanish instructions, was ironic. I came here to, <laughs> from the States to support teachers in Spanish. But they have a very, a lot of private schools in Santiago, you might know, uh, have a very large uh, immigrant population. So a lot of them, the private schools, have students that, uh, whose parents work in the companies or in the, a lot of companies here. And so they usually move every two years. And so their Spanish is what uh, is harder to for them to kind of uh, improve because they are in an environment where it's only English mostly in the school and so there's their English and because they have moved so much their English skills are very um, strong but sometimes their Spanish skills are very low so in the school that I was working they, a lot of the students had um, or, or the school in terms of the standards was performing lower in Spanish than compared to other private schools and so that was one of the reasons professional development. So uh, this uh, specific project that I'm going to be working on is really to examine the reading trajectory of Chilean students in the early grades, so from uh, kindergarten or what they call here educación parvularia to third grade. And I want to uh, use some uh, formative assessments that uh, we have been developing at the University of Oregon to kind of see how we can understand the reading trajectory of, uh, the reading trajectory of uh, young kids. And we focus on you know, five core components of reading, and I'll explain them you know, in a minute. And then uh, the other thing that I'm going to be doing is to uh, provide giving some lectures to teachers, uh, pre-service and in-service teachers, about how to uh, deliver uh, reading instruction in a more, uh, let's say, scientifically based uh, way. And so the reason for the study is that currently there are no formative assessments that really assess how students are doing in the early grades in, in Chile. And then, uh, and then also the extensive research that we know in, uh, in English and in Spanish uh, speaking countries that indicate that you know, early detection and prevention is much more effective than trying to solve reading problems, for example, in the later grades, middle school and high school. Um, and then uh, one of the things that we have found too is that reading difficulties can also affect uh, the, the emotions, you know? so social emotional behaviors and then also poor self-esteem and that can lead to many other problems that uh, sometimes we don't um, necessarily, might not necessarily associate with reading but they have like this uh, kind of causal have been provoked by having reading difficulties. I don't know, for example, if you know that in the States, uh, for example, um, students who are uh, struggling in reading in uh, third grade the assessment, that's how some of those prisons determine how many beds they will need later on for uh, potential, um, you know, people who might be violent or crimes or so. So it's kind of a, an important <laughs> um, 
a way to think about uh, what, why, why reading is, uh, and why we should focus so much on reading, particularly in, Chile in, uh, in the early grades. And so why Chile, one of the interests that I have is, I was very impressed have coming here before, on the emphasis on inclusion and also respect for diversity that um, uh, the government and the Indonesian government has fostered in, uh, in Chile. So this was maybe coming six or seven years ago when I came. Um, and there was a strong uh, input to be more inclusive. So all kids should be in a regular classroom and there should not be differences in terms of students who are reading difficulties where they should go, which classroom. So it's much more inclusive. Um, now the problem with that is that then you have to also train teachers on how to deal with a very diverse population inside the classroom. And that was one of the struggles that, uh, I mean, we have also in the States, but also in Chile, too. Um, then the other one is the concern about results from the reading assessment in second and fourth grade, um, and second grade and above. Um, the need to really kind of like focus on these five core components of reading that I'll explain in a minute. And then to foster the collaboration also between uh, special education teachers and regular teachers, you know, because that's the, if we want to have a more inclusive classroom, then we also have to have the, the teachers that will collaborate with special education teachers to provide the support that the kids need. Um, and then also, of course, my previous experience with Chilean uh, teachers and researchers, I always found that there's a lot of excitement here about learning, about how to improve, about how to make things better and work. And sometimes, I know yesterday we talked a bit about the protests, but sometimes the protests have also, you know, like kind of a, a cause in terms of improving outcomes for the majority of the population. And so I think that um, I'm always kind of attracted to this energy, positive energy for change. So uh, just kind of to give you a bit of the reading trends and compare Chile with the states. So for example, um, based on, is Chile has also a, a, a national assessment of educational progress, just like the states. And it here it's called CIMSEP. And from that, um, you know, in second grade, 38% of the kids can read um, um, ad adequately, what we call adequately, and about 62% read at an elementary level or below. And then in fourth grade, that's a little bit lower, 45% and 55% uh, read, um, read at an elementary level. Uh, but the, you can see that also there is a strong reading gap between students with low SES and students with um, high SES. You know, the gap is about 70%. Uh, in the States, uh, things are a little bit worse even than that. <laughs> Um, the results of in 2017 from the NAVE showed that in fourth grade, only 37% of students can read uh, at or above proficient, and about 68% can read at the basic level. Um, and then in the reading gap between low SES and high SES is actually 30%. So uh, students who, with higher income are performing obviously better than students with low income. So now going here to reading components. Uh, so these are kind of the five reading components that we think and that show, sci uh, evidence shows that are uh, uh, important or fundamental to, to learn how to read. And one is phonemic awareness, which is understanding that words are made out of sounds and that um, when you say a word, you're kind of like basically combining a series of sounds to, um, to say that word or to read. Uh, the other one is phonics, where we know that letters are symbols for sounds. So uh, a letter is really uh, a way to understand and to read the code uh, for a sound in, in a word. The fluency is kind of just reading with uh, prosody and without uh, too, ma too many errors to be able to understand what the text says uh, and very vocabulary and comprehension. Uh, and so, but the tricky thing is that we have to combine all those five components in order to really learn, uh, to read to learn, no? Um, so I'm going to skip here. And here a little bit like the timelines, but the, just going back to, to the uh, proposal here in Chile to develop these formative assessments. Basically, like what a formative assessment is, 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 is like when you go to the doctor and the first thing the doctor does is take your pressure, um, you know, take your weight, and then also your temperature. And with that, you can gauge exactly how you know, sick a person is. And this is a little bit like the same with, um, with these assessments. You know, we really want to screen students quickly, not spend too much time assessing them, but really um, understand where their trajectory is. And this would help um, 
teachers also guide the instruction. So if teachers know where students are, they can uh, guide the instruction much better than if teachers just kind of are guessing how students are performing, which is what happens <coughs> in the States too, but also here. Um, so here, for example, if we can assess students and determine where they are at risk and which component, we can immediately um, um, identify them and then also group them accordingly. And you can do that within the classroom, so in an inclusive classroom, you can have students who might be at different um, kind of reading levels, but they are receiving the instruction that they need specifically for that um, level of um, reading performance. And so you can then um, you know, determine whether students are growing or not, and if they are not, then what are you going to do to improve that? And we can do it at a group level, or we can do it at an individual level. So kind of like have aim lines, where students can, get, can uh, based on the intervention they are receiving, we can determine whether they, uh, they know how to feed or not, or be improving, making growth. So the reason, research design for this project is going to be a mixed method. So we have, we're going to have quantitative data, and we're going to use hierarchical linear modeling and also non-slow variance to, um, to, to collect the, the information that we want in terms of the reading skills. And then we're also going to do qualitative data. So we're going to do some surveys and, uh, and observations in the classroom just to understand better what the context is so where the students are learning to read. And here I have five research questions, but basically the main idea is like, what is the strength of the association between all these five skills? And uh, does it vary, does the strength vary based on individual characteristics of the students? So we're going to, of course, take into account age and gender and uh, socioeconomic status and other uh, characteristics of students. And then we're going to also find out whether teachers can um, believe that these assessments might help them, and then how they think they would be able to implement them in the classroom to support the instruction. And then our participants will be about 200 students per grade from uh, um, preschool up to third grade. And if, uh, you know, we anticipate usually having more than 200 students per grade, so we're going to randomly assign, uh, randomly determine, you know, select them for the for the study. Uh, all, if all the students will be eligible to participate, so we're not going to make uh, differences in terms of, um, you know, if they have any other emotional problems or any other things. I mean, unless they, of course, can take the tests, but uh, these assessments will have all these continued rules, so we can stop at any time. Uh, and then we'll try to oversample also students who speak other native languages besides Spanish. You know? So there is a, a push now from the government to also take into account indigenous populations in Chile and there, is, there are standards for them. So we, want, we hope we can get at least a group of those students. And then also um, my understanding is that there has been a growth in the Haitian population here. So Chile has accepted a lot of Haitian refugees. And so one of the struggles that they, uh, their kids have in school is they don't speak the language, and so how can we kind of like, uh, you know, um, incorporate them into the system and also teach them Spanish as a second language, but at the same time also maintain their own uh, or, uh, language. No? Uh, and so the measures, as I was telling you about, work are these kind of more fluency measures, but we're also going to use a comprehension measure that was developed in Chile, it's the Prueba de Comprensión Lectora, um, to kind of map whether the skills that we are um, saying um, help kids learn how to read also will be translated into better comprehension based on this measure assessment. And here's a little bit like the proposed timeline, but I think that's one of the biggest roadblocks that I have encountered. And I don't know, I think yesterday for the presentations, uh, you know, so maybe <laughs> affect all of our studies. And it's well, schools haven't started as I thought in early March, or well, will not start in early March. And uh, the Universidad Católica del Maule will start uh, on the 30, 23rd of March, and that's for just the newcomers. And then the students who have been in the university will start in April. So. Uh, you know, we'll need to train a lot of data collectors to collect this data, which will be the students, but we won't be able to do it until they actually are in class and uh, starting. So the project, uh, as I was hoping that we would maybe uh, start data collection in April, might in early April might kind of be delayed a little bit. And so um, I hope to do two data collections um, while I'm here. And then uh, my colleagues, Manuel Gonzalve and, and uh, Others from the University of will continue with this project so that they can, uh, we can kind of connect potentially with our data for this study. And um, 
and then here if any questions or these are um, the, some of the teachers and actually master students that uh, incorporated some of the vocabulary interventions that we did uh, in the states and they had adjusted it to the needs of the population. They worked in a public school in Constitución, a very small town in um, southern Chile, but they had incredible effects and this was a very marginalized um, population with a lot of um, vocabulary <coughs> and language uh, issues and uh, she incorporated some of those uh, you know, kind of interventions that we have been developing and uh, really the kids loved it. And what was interesting yesterday, for example, hearing from Sandra how, how to develop systems, well, the administrators there also as, um, kind of like took that uh, project into account uh, seriously, and so everybody in the school was starting to develop this uh, more vocabulary, uh, explicit vocabulary instruction that helped all the kids across the school. So. So there are ways of getting the systems in place. It's just uh, it's not just tricky here or in the states. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you.